War, you gotta get out and vote to get the things we're fighting for, fighting for, fighting for. To get the things we're fighting for, you gotta get out and vote to clinch that happy ending on the Tokyo, the Berlin, and the Rome front. The fellow with the bullet is depending on the fellow with the ballot on the home front. Oh, we want to have a better world, better world, better world. Want to have a better world, you gotta get out and vote. <laughs> Humphrey Bogart. I'm a registered voter in the 16th Congressional District of California. I'm one of a number of people from a great many walks of life who've come here tonight of our own free will because we have a deep and common interest in the outcome tomorrow of the most important election in this history of our country. We're here to tell you why we're going to vote a certain way, and what we've got to say will come straight from the shoulder, even if it's sung sometimes instead of spoken. Personally, I'm voting for Franklin D. Roosevelt because I think he's one of the world's greatest humanitarians and because, and because he's leading our fight against the enemies of a free people in a free world. Millions of other people are for him for the same reason or perhaps very different reasons. And a few of these people are here with us tonight to let you in on their particular angle. Some have come from long distances like the man at my elbow who reaches his microphone by way of Cambridge, Massachusetts, San Diego and Tarawa. My name is Harry Candler. I joined the Navy at the age of 48 because I felt the danger confronting us. I felt that the security of my children and your children was at stake. Last September, Mrs. Kendler and I lost a son somewhere in France. Another son is in the Army. Until I was disabled off Tarawa, I did everything possible in the Navy to fulfill my obligation to my children. Right now, I'd like to say this. If our president is defeated, I will feel as though I were defeated because he typifies everything I felt I was fighting for. I want to hold on to our social gains. I wouldn't want to see my shipmates living in shacks in empty lots. It isn't easy to forget the Hoovervilles after the First World War. Most important, I don't want a Third World War. I don't want to risk my third son's life at the untried and inexperienced hands of a city district attorney. I'm sure you don't. Standing now at a microphone in New York is a man who saw action 12,000 miles from Tawawa, an Italian boy from the Bronx. Go ahead, Jim. Jim Longy's my name. I'm a merchant seaman, member of the National Maritime Union, CIO. I was torpedoed twice, once in the Mediterranean and once off Normandy. That was bad enough. But to be torpedoed in your own state by your own governor, that's something else. 20,000 of us merchant seamen from the state of New York have been robbed of the right to vote by our little Governor Dewey. Every port I've made overseas, the people are praying America will re-elect FDR, especially the people of Italy, where my own folks come from. They want the same thing we do, peace that will stick and jobs and security that go with it. I'll be shipping out soon. But next time I come home, I know Dewey will be back in Albany and Roosevelt will still be in the White House. Now I want to introduce a man I've never seen. An ex-Army pilot with a DFC, Oak Leaf Cluster, Air Medal, and Purple Heart. His name is Ballin, and he's in California. Come in, Harold. Thanks, sailor. About me, I was discharged from the Army Air Force after 54 missions. The flag finally caught up with me out of New Caledonia. Got me in the spine and leg, but the doctors have fixed me up and I'm doing okay. 
I was 22 when I left college to join the Royal Air Force and do a bit of flying over France. After Pearl Harbor, I transferred to our own Air Force and flew in the Pacific. Right now I'm working and looking forward to the Veterans Rehabilitation Plan. This government's helping me go back and finish my studies. They're helping me to get four more years of college, including $80 a month in tuition. I understand that Governor Dewey has not only cheated merchant sailors out of their vote in this election, but he's fixed the soldier ballot so that most of the men from his state, fighting down where I've been, won't get a chance to vote. Well, that trick will probably save him a lot of Roosevelt votes, but I don't think it's going to work. I've talked with the mothers and fathers of a good many of those lads. Now, I'll tell you something. Dewey can't stop them. Tomorrow will prove that. To be a job for everyone, everyone, everyone. Be a job for everyone, we gotta get out and vote. You wanna have security, security, security. You wanna have security, you gotta get out and vote. The growing big red apples that Hoover is promoting. If you don't want to sell those apples, start voting, man, start voting. Oh, well, get behind the president, president, president. Get behind the president, brother, make him vote. This is Humphrey Bogart again. As you must know by now, election year is a great time for speech making, and it's much easier to talk a good game than play it. As of tonight, the two main Republican candidates have made around 74 major speeches. Mathematically speaking, that would be 74 times two sides of the mouth times two, which gets to be pretty confusing. In fact, it comes under the heading of double talk, and that's why, and that's where Cliff Nazaro comes in. I'm a professional actor. I specialize in double talk, the kind which comes out of both sides of your mouth at once, like this. Now, I walked into a girl a sailor raid, and if I hadn't made the safe she water me and Miss Dalton, we did want to rate. We didn't cast for spec to bring all the little cavalries of the mouse. We just went through a fat race and won't get from tent. That's double talk. If you believe the Republicans, then the president didn't prepare us for war. He merely went forced to start around to get the slaughter and security, the pre-war fine of us to get played with forced to be seat, and give me that crunch. And that's the read for it. Furthermore, we can't have... So I say, if... Dewey wants to run against me, Cliff Nazaro, okay. That's what I call honest competition because I like to take on double talkers face to face. I'd like to straighten out some of that Dewey double talk myself. My name is Lorraine McDonald. I'm a housewife and a mother, and I come from Governor Dewey's home state, Michigan. It's my business to make my home comfortable and efficient in spite of wartime difficulties. Now, I've heard a lot of talk against so-called bureaucracy in government, and I'll tell you this. I'm thankful for the bureaucracy that keeps grocery prices within my reach. I'm thankful for the bureaucracy that keeps people who have more money than we have from buying up the scarce commodities simply because they have the means. The Republicans who have been making such a noise about bureaucracy were themselves the most bungling bureaucrats in the history of our country. If you younger housewives have forgotten teapot dome and the depression, ask Dad, he knows. I'm thankful that in this war, unlike the last one, it's share and share alike. If the rationing of shoes and gas and other things needed to win the war comes under the heading of bureaucracy, then I say thank God for that bureaucracy and for the president who was far-sighted enough to set it up. A few miles outside the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee, off a winding country highway named Cloud Springs Road, stands a good-looking farmhouse that was built under the New Deal. If you were to drive up to that farmhouse right now, you'd see light coming from the window of the living room. And inside that room, the family and friends of John S. Christian are at this moment gathered around the radio listening to this program. Mrs. Christian is there, and young Morris, and Jean Christian, and a few neighbors. But the head of the family, John Christian himself, is not there with them. He's right here. He came all the way out here to California on the strength of a conviction. A conviction that made him mark an absentee ballot for FDR and Truman. That's right, Mr. Bogan. I'm a farmer from Tennessee. And I'm here to straighten Mr. Dewey out on one of his arguments. Maybe you remember those speeches where Mr. Dewey tried to poke fun at the New Deal, giving us the initials of a lot of government agencies. Well, there's one set of initials that he never did mention, and that's the letters TVA. But most folks know those initials stands for one of the biggest jobs ever done in America. Where I come from, they mean saving the soil in three states. TVA means flood control, power projects, and brand new industries. It's helping win the war, too. 
But those letters, TVA, also stand for a project that the Republicans fought tooth and nail. That's one reason why I'm voting for President Roosevelt, the man who was behind TVA, because it was one of the things that showed how much courage and foresight he had. And we're going to need a lot of that from now on. 2,000 miles south and west of John Christian's farm in Tennessee is an ordinary business office at 524 South Spring Street, Los Angeles. There are five girls in that office, all of them members of a union, and all of them for Roosevelt together with their boss. One of those girls is here and wants to tell you why. My name is Dorothy Hewitt, and I'm a member of the CIO Union, Local 9, United Office and Professional Workers of America. I guess you could call me a white-collar worker or an average wage earner. At any rate, tomorrow I'm going to be an average voter. Naturally, I've been interested in this election and, in fact, I contributed a dollar to the PAC. I gave it voluntarily, like all the other contributors, because we want to see worthwhile men get into office, regardless of party affiliation. According to the Republicans, my giving a dollar to the PAC makes me a dangerous character. Well, I only wish there were 13 million more girls like me who could also give a dollar each toward honest government. And then we would equal the $13 million given to the Republican Party by one man, Joseph Pugh, the multimillionaire oil man. Now, as a white-collar worker in this war, I've been glad to accept the ceiling on wages. My name is Garrett, Lester Garrett. I'm an airplane mechanic at Lockheed Aircraft and a trade union man from way back. I've noticed that comes election time, certain people all of a sudden are labor's best friends. Well, that's the gag the Republicans have been pulling in this campaign. Except where they find out Labor's wires to them. Then the Republicans start yelling their heads off and calling Labor unions every name in the book. Well, now I happen to be an AFL man myself. But it looks fishy to me that the Republicans should be squawking about a working man. Any working man giving a buck to the political party he believes in. When those same Republicans are taking millions of dollars from the big money boys. Most of whom have long anti-union records. I said I thought it was funny. But I'm not laughing about it. I'm just voting. Voting for Roosevelt. I'm Bill McCartney, brakeman on the New York Central and a member of the Brotherhood of Railroad Trainmen. I just want to say that we fellows in organized labor get awfully tired of having our intelligence assaulted every four years by Republicans who tell us they are going to do better by us than the Democratic Party. Don't they think we know what FDR has done for labor? We know how the Republicans have fought him. Each time he protected us from unfair hours, bad working conditions, and low wages. And you folks who worry about all this high-pressure publicity for Dewey and his friends, you people who think maybe the working man is fooled by their phony arguments, just take it easy. The working man knows more about this fight and what it means to him than any other group of Americans. He has more to lose if FDR loses, more to win if FDR wins. And that's no fooling. This is Jim Cagney, member of the Screen Actors Guild. I guess I'm just an old sentimentalist about those bygone days when the gangsters I used to play in the movies were rum running all over the place. But under the first Roosevelt administration, prohibition was repealed and bootlegging became a lost art. Soon afterwards, Roosevelt's Department of Justice took care of the mobsters in general. Well, as I say, I feel pretty mellow about those dear old days, so I hope you'll understand it if I break down and sing a song together with two other sentimentalists, Keenan Wynn, and Groucho Marx. <coughs> Do you remember those dear old bygone days of the rugged individual and the dole, dole, dole? Remember her, the Hoover, and his sweet old-fashioned ways. And Harding with his record, black as coal, oh, black, black as coal. coal. In that good old Hoover time, in that good old Hoover time, lots of jobs for everyone. Blank, and cry. Money singing everywhere, and you spare a dime. Don't go back with Dewey to that good old Hoover time. Do you remember?
remember those anti-labor laws, the struggle of the dries against the wets, wets, wets. Remember Teapot Dome and relief for every home, and the tear gas bombs and bullets for the vets. Oh. in your face, stocks were tumbling down, prosperity round the corner, red lines round the block, don't let Hoover bring Dewey to the sidewalks of New York, yuck, 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 mm. we, we don't, don't want a depression just like the depression that ruined Dear old dad. Yeah. In memory of the red communism scare, which has been used by the Republicans with distinguished lack of success in 1936, 1940, 1944, Dewey marches off. The old red scare. The old red herring, the old red herring. It talks like Hitler, but it smells like Gehring. The old red scare, it ain't what it used to be a few short years ago. It ain't what it used to be, the old red scare, it ain't what it used to be, the old red scare, it ain't what it used to be a few short years ago. Don't look now, folks, but is anybody interested in a better world? We want to have a better world, better world, better world. Want to have a better world, we got to get out and vote. Now we're on the right track, right track, right track. Now we're on the right track, we're going to win the war. The track ahead is clear now. Let's keep those engines humming. Don't change the engineer now, because the new world's better. For every one of us here tonight, there are millions and millions of people riding on the Roosevelt Special. Some of these people are known to you. Others, like the folks you're meeting on this program, may be unknown to you. But the California section of the train is filled with faces and voices that you'll recognize immediately. And they're all here to introduce themselves. I'm Salula Bankhead. I'm on this train. Joan Bennett for the champ. Irving Berlin. And Mrs. Irving Berlin. Virginia Root for Roosevelt and Truman. For Roosevelt! Harry Carey. They're my boys, too. And Claudette Colbert. Joseph Cotton. Linda Darnell for the president. John Garfield, ditto. Paulette Goddard for a fourth turn. James Gleason, likewise. Susan Hayward, count me in. This is Rita Hayward. You know who I'm voting for. Paula Houston, and those are my sentiments. Move over, Walter. This is Rex Ingram. Hello, Mama Jessel. This is Georgie. Vote for Roosevelt. Danny Kay, all the way for Roosevelt. This is Gene Kelly, army bound, but not before I vote for Roosevelt. Evelyn Keyes with an X for FDR. Croucher Marks without the mustache. Paul Muni, I've got my ticket. This is Richard Wolf, my ballot's ready. This is George Raff, we've got to get out and vote. This is Edward G. Robinson with my vote. Gail Thunderguard for the Commander-in-Chief. Lana Turner for Roosevelt and Victory. Tony Willard all the way for Roosevelt. This is Jane Wyman sitting next to... Keenan Wynn saying another win for Roosevelt. (laughs) 
And this is only part of the western section of the Roosevelt train, which stretches all the way across the country. And now, if you'll hang under your hats, we'll switch you over to New York section. Come in, New York. We're voting for Roosevelt. Alma Rice, playwright. Constance Bennett, actress. We're for Roosevelt. All aboard for Roosevelt. Wait for me, Waldo Pierce, artist. And me, Dorothy Maynard, singer. Me too, Vincent Sheehan, author. For Roosevelt. Mark Connolly, playwright. Louis Altemeyer, poet. Fanny Harris, author. Tomorrow's the day. Vote for Roosevelt. Here's three more votes. Olin Downs, music critic. Faye Ray, actress. Bennett Cerf, publisher. All aboard for Roosevelt. John Doe. I said John, philosopher. Ben A. Venuta, singer. Eddie Dowling, actor and producer for Roosevelt. For Roosevelt. Playwright and producer, Russell Proud. Photographer, Paul Strand. Author, Dorothy Parker. Get there early. Vote for Roosevelt. I'll be there. John Gunther, foreign correspondent and author. So will I. Bill Helmer Stephenson, explorer. It will be my first vote. Charles Boyer, actor and American citizen. All aboard for Roosevelt. Alonzo Myers, educator. Here's my ticket. A straight ticket, Edna Ferber. For Roosevelt! Barney Ross, ex-fighter, ex-marine. The ink spot, horse spot. See you at the polls. For, for Roosevelt! Well, this is Gertrude Berg. You know me, Molly. You know me too, I hope. Milton Burrow. For, for Roosevelt! I'm Francho Tone. I'm Frank Sinatra. I'm nobody. I said I'm nobody. Nobody's heard of me. Joe Miller is my name. I fought in the last war. I served in the Navy. I'm another kind of a veteran, too. I'm a veteran of Anacostia Flats. That's the place in Washington where us bonus marchers build a town out of crates and tin cans. That's the place where a Republican president ordered an attack on us veterans and our families and drove us out with guns and gas. On July 28, 1932, I saw two of my buddies get killed in that attack. I was there. I saw them killed. Now, here is why I am voting for Roosevelt. He gave us vets a square deal and a new deal. Roosevelt will see that the kids in this war will get a break, too. Roosevelt has been for all the people all the time. With Roosevelt, we will get a plan to give jobs to everyone. When somebody says to you, we had a new deal depression, you ask him, what was the name of those shanty towns all over the country? like the ones we built down at Anacosta. Ask him, was it Roosevelt Wills or Hoover Wills? I'm Carl Milliton. <clears throat> I've been running a small manufacturing plant in Brooklyn for a good many years. I am what you call little business, and I've had my ups and downs, but not my outs. The closest that I came to getting squeezed out wasn't during the Depression. My troubles began before that, in the boom years. The big mergers and the combines were eating up all the little fellows like me. They had their hooks onto me, too. And when I say they, I mean the big money boys. Then came Roosevelt. Under his administration, the antitrust laws began to be enforced, really enforced, for the first time. I ought to know. They saved my hide. That's why I don't think it's time for a change. I'm Captain John Patrick, ambulance driver in the American Field Service. I've just come back after two and a half years in North Africa, India, and Burma. In Burma, I was with a section that was surrounded by Japs for three months. These men lived and fought from day to day on supplies brought into them by plane. The day I got back in New York, a taxi driver turned around and said to me, Son of a gun, this the man of Dewey, she's a green. That isn't funny, and I'll tell you why. I came home on a transport crowded with army flyers who had either served 50 missions or were wounded. The men I talked to on that ship felt the same way about this election as the taxi driver and myself, apprehensive at the idea of switching to amateurs. And I'm particularly apprehensive about the kind of amateurs. Governor Dewey, by rigging the voting laws of New York State, made it impossible for me and thousands of men in my situation to vote. And so, I'm talking to you. 
appealing to you, really, in the hope that some one of you who is undecided tonight will vote in my place tomorrow for Mr. Roosevelt. This is Quentin Reynolds, and I say check to what John Patrick just told you. I'll use my minute talking to you mothers and fathers who are listening tonight with your hearts overseas. I've been over there in the fighting fronts, and I can tell you that your boy knows what he's fighting for. To hear Dewey, you get the idea that our soldiers are fighting for one thing and that we back home are fighting for another thing. We know that isn't so. We know all of us are fighting for the same thing, a short war and a long peace. Our GIs aren't letting us down over there, and it would be a pretty sad business if we were to let them down back here. Our choice is clear enough between a great commander-in-chief and a bright young prosecuting attorney. I'll take Roosevelt. I'm Russell Davenport. I'm a registered Republican. I fought hard for a Republican victory in 1940. I was all set to fight for one this year. But it isn't the same Republican Party this year. It's a different party. It has lost its principles. There's only one issue in this campaign. That's the issue of the peace. We must learn how to maintain peace, not alone, but jointly with other nations. The Republicans have failed to meet this issue. I don't think we can rely on them to work with other nations. But Mr. Roosevelt has met the issue better. He has fought the war side by side with other nations. Therefore, we are winning the war. I believe that with him we have our best chance to maintain peace with other nations so that we can also win the peace. Do you agree with me, Bartley Crumb, out there in San Francisco? Of course I do, Russell. And as a registered Republican who, like yourself, worked hard for a Republican victory four years ago, I feel that this is the hour of decision. Tomorrow, America will be weighed in the balance and not found wanting. Peace doesn't just happen. Peace is won only by leaders who love peace and work to make peace a firm reality in this war-scarred world. The Republican Party has failed utterly in meeting the challenge. Both its platform and its candidate have evaded the issue have walked around it timidly like an elephant on a flimsy bridge. As lifelong Republicans, none of us found it easy to make this decision. But as independent Republicans, all of us can make no other choice. The party once led by Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, and Wendell Wilkie today shows itself false both to their memories and to their principles. Already tomorrow's sun is rising over Europe as it reaches our Atlantic coast, races westward and dips below the battle rim Pacific. I am supremely confident that American citizens will, by voting for Franklin D. Roosevelt, be weighed in the balance and not found wanting. This is Bogart back in Hollywood. While we're weighing things in the balance, Mr. Crumb, let's not overlook Mr. Dewey's record, a record which the best Republicans find one of his least attractive features. We've got a song on the subject of Mr. Dewey's record, and it's going to be sung now by the rising young star, June Richmond. The ship of state, oh the ship of state, it's a good boat, it's a right boat, but the ship of state, yes the ship of state, is not the Albany night boat, and when the people come out to vote, someone is gonna miss that boat. So don't look now, Mr. Dewey, but your record is showing. Yes, your record is showing. Your New Deal trousers are smart, no doubt, but the old deal shirt tail is sticking out. So don't look now, Mr. Dewey, but the boys who have signed you are right there behind you. There's Bert McCormick right in your groove. And John the Dollies and Herb the Who. You made it tough for G.I. Joe to get his ballot through. But his father and his mother and his sister and his brother know exactly what to do November 7th. Don't look now, Mr. Dewey, but your record is a fooey. 
The soldier vote you jumbled On Russia you fumbled On land lease you grumbled On world peace you mumbled The dumbbells you've assembled Will be stumbled, bumbled So do we download now Thank you, June Richmond We take you now to New York This is Avril Harriman From my experience abroad during the last four years, I can say with complete assurance that never in history has one man, Roosevelt, attained the confidence of so many peoples of so many nations. It is well known abroad that Dewey is supported and it is believed surrounded by our isolationists. If Dewey were elected, doubt of our intent would take the place of this confidence. Our leadership in the world could not fail but be impaired for some time. There is no time to rebuild confidence. It is my earnest judgment that Dewey's election would prolong the war. With Roosevelt as our president, we will retain the successful leadership and the full unity of the Allies created by Roosevelt for the war and in shaping the world for the peace we are fighting to attain. And that is why we, Republicans and Democrats alike, urge all of you to vote for Franklin D. Roosevelt. This is Bogart again. The existence of the United Nations in both fact and principle is one of the greatest accomplishments of this war. The spirit of this newfound unity has never been better expressed than in a song by Yip Harburg and Earl Robinson called The Free and Equal Blues. You're going to hear it now for the first time, but I dare say it won't be the last. The Free and Equal Blues, sung by Earl Robinson and Clarence Muse. We went down to the St. James in Hermory. And we saw some plasma there. And I ups and asked the doctor man, was the donor from America, Africa, India, Asia, or where? The doctor laughed right in my face and gave it straight to me. Said a molecule is a molecule, son, and it's got no geography. Well, I never knew. Ever since that day, I've got those free and equal blues. You mean you heard that dog declare the plasma in that test tube there could be white man, black man, yellow man, red? That's what he said. The doctor put down his doctor book and gave me a very scientific look. And he speaks out plain and clear and rational. Metabolism is international. Cause ever since that day I've got those free and equal blues. Well, he rigged up his microscope with some Berlin blue blood. And by gosh, it was the same as Chung King, Queeb, Chef, Chattanooga, Timbuk, Dublin. <laughs> why them Aryans, Goring and Goebel? They don't even know the corpuscle is global. Trying to disunite us with their racial supremacy. Flying in the face of old man chemistry. Taking all the facts and trying to twist them. But you can't overthrow the circulatory system. And that's what you, that's what you. So we stayed at the St. James Infirmary. Mm -hmm. well, we wasn't going to leave that place, was we, boy? No, sir. <laughs> that was too interesting. Yeah. I said, give me some more of that scientific talk talk. And he did. Yeah. He said, melt yourself down in a crucible, son. Pour yourself out into a test tube. And what have you got? 3,500 cubic feet of gas. The same for the upper and the lower class. Well, well, we'll just let that pass. <laughs> Carbon, 22 pounds, 10 ounces. 
You mean that goes for princes, dukes, and counts? Whatever you are, that's what the amount is. Carbon, 22 pounds, 10 ounces. Iron, 57 grains. That's not enough to keep a man in chains. 50 ounces of phosphorus, whether you're poor or prosperous. Buddy, can you spare man? Sugar, 60 ordinary lumps. Three and equal rations for all nations. Then you take 20 teaspoonfuls of sodium chloride. That's all. Mix with 38 quarts of H2O. That's water. Add two ounces of lime. Uh-huh. The soup's on a hydrochloric acid. Yeah. And you stir it all up. And what are you? A walk-in drugstore. An international metabolistic cartel. <laughs> And Mexican, Mongolian, Tyrolean, and Tartar. The doctor's right behind the Atlantic Charter. The doc's behind the new brotherhood of men. As prescribed at Casablanca and Cairo and Moscow and Tehran. He agrees with Dr. Roosevelt. Dr. Churchill, Dr. Stalin, Dr. Eden Hall and Litvinoff. Every, every man, man everywhere is the same when he's got his skin off. That's a new, that's a new, that's a big One of the remarkable developments of this campaign has been the large number of normally Republican leaders and voters who have thrown their support to Roosevelt because their consciences could not permit them to vote for the man who seized control of the Republican Party. There are millions of them, some of them outstanding, like Senator Ball of Minnesota, Russell Davenport, Bartley Crum, other lifelong Republicans like country editor Hilton Higgins of Caldwell, New Jersey, who wanted to appear on this program, but is too busy campaigning for Roosevelt tonight back in his hometown. Many a newspaper which supported Wendell Wilkie in 1940 supports the president today. Among them, the New York Times, the Portland, Oregon Journal, to mention only two. As I say, Republicans in all sections of the country will be with us tomorrow. But here now is a man whose father and grandfather were Republicans before him and who well remembers the greatest Republican of them all. Julius Oscar Rainier is my name. I was 94 years old last October. I can remember way back to 1858 in Galesburg, Illinois, when Abraham Lincoln shook my hand. I have voted in 19 elections, if you include this one. Voted most of my life for men who I thought could do the most good for me and mine. That's why I have voted for Roosevelt before, and that's why I'm going to vote for him again. I don't know how long I'll be around to enjoy the benefits of a world at peace. So this time, I'm voting for those who will enjoy them, the young folks the soldiers coming back from the war, and the young women waiting for them to come back, some of them perhaps voting for the first time, like the very young lady standing next to me. My name's Betty Hall. I've come a long way, all the way from Decatur, Georgia. But I didn't come for the ride. I'm 18 years old, and in Georgia you can vote when you're 18. And they asked me to come here and tell you why I'm going to vote for President Roosevelt. After hearing the others, there's not very much I can add. Only I'm more convinced than ever. And most of the young people I know feel the same way about the president. We think that even though Mr. Roosevelt is older than Mr. Dewey, he really understands young people better. I guess it's just in the heart, not in years. 
The president has certainly done more for people my age than anyone else I know of. And I suppose Americans of other ages could say the same. He's just done more for America. I'm very serious about my vote. When I cast my ballot tomorrow, it will be the greatest privilege I've ever had as an American citizen. But the second greatest privilege I've ever had is the honor of introducing the man I'm going to vote for. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, as we sit quietly this evening in our home at Hyde Park, our thoughts, like those of millions of other Americans, are most deeply concerned with the well-being of all our American fighting men. We are thinking of our own sons, all of them far away from home, and of our neighbor's sons and the sons of our friends. That concern rises above all others in this critical period of our national life. In great contrast to the quiet which is ours here in America, in our own secure homes is the knowledge that most of those fighting men of ours have no quiet time and little leisure at this hour to reflect on the significance of our American Election Day tomorrow. Some are standing at battle stations on shipboard, tense in the excitement of action. Some lie in wet foxholes or trudge doggedly through the sticky mud, firing as they go. Still others are high above the earth, fighting Messerschmitts or Zeros. All of them are giving everything they've got to defeat our enemies. And uppermost in all our minds is the one thought to win the war as soon as possible so that they may return to the quiet and peace of their own homes. But in the midst of fighting, in the presence of our brutal enemies, our soldiers and sailors and airmen will not forget Election Day back home. Millions of these men have already cast their own ballots and they will be wondering about the outcome of the election and what it will mean to them in their future lives. And sooner or later, all of them will be asking questions as to whether the folks back home looked after their interests, their liberties, their government, their country, while they themselves were off at war. Our boys are counting on us to show the rest of the world that our kind of government is the best in the world and the kind we propose to keep. And so, when our people turn out at the polls tomorrow, and I sincerely hope that it will be 50 million strong, the world will respect our democracy and the grand old stars and stripes will wave more proudly than ever before. These brave fighters of ours have taken on enemies on both sides of the world, enemies who were nurtured since childhood in militarism. These boys of ours, wisely led and using the matchless weapons which you here at home have sent to them, have outfought those ruthless enemies, outfought them on the land, outfought them on the sea, outfought them in the skies. They are winning the victory for all of us. Many are giving life itself. And it is for us to make certain that we win for them, the living and the dead, a lasting peace. There is nothing adequate which anyone in any place can say to those who are entitled to display the gold star in their windows but each night as the people of the United States rest in their homes, which have been safe from violence during all these years of the most violent war in all history, I am sure all of them silently give thought to their feelings of deepest gratitude to the brave departed and to their families for the immeasurable sacrifice that they have made for the cause of decency and freedom and civilization. I do not want to talk to you tonight of partisan politics, 
The political battle is finished. Our task now is to face the future as a militant and a united people, united here at home as well as on the battlefronts. Twice in 25 years, our people have had to put on a brave, smiling front as they have suffered the anxiety and the agony of war. And no one wants to endure that suffering again. When we, when we think of the speed and long distance possibilities of air travel of all kinds to the remotest corners of the earth, we must consider the devastation wrought on the people of England, for example, by the new long-range bombs. Another war would be bound to bring even more devilish and powerful instruments of destruction to wipe out civilian populations. No coastal defenses, however strong, could prevent these silent missiles of death fired perhaps from planes or ships at sea, from crashing deep within the United States itself. This time, this time we must be certain that the peace-loving nations of the world band together in determination to outlaw and to prevent war. Tomorrow, you, the people of the United States, Again, vote as free men and women, with full freedom of choice, with no secret police watching over your shoulders. And for generations to come, Americans will continue to prove their faith in free elections. But when the ballots are cast, your responsibilities do not cease. The public servants you elect cannot fulfill that trust unless you, the people, watch and advise them. Raise your voices in protest when you believe your public servants to be wrong. Back them up when you believe them to be right. But not for one single moment can you now or later forget the all-important goals for which we are aiming. To win the war and unite our fighting men with their families at the earliest moment. See that all have honorable jobs. And to create a world peace organization which will prevent this disaster or one like it from ever coming upon us again. To achieve these goals, we need strength and wisdom, which is greater than is bequeathed to mere mortals. We need divine help and guidance. We people of America have ever had a deep well of religious strength, far back to the days of the Pilgrim Fathers. <coughs> and so, on this thoughtful evening, I believe that you will find it fitting that I read a prayer sent to me not long ago. Almighty God, of whose righteous will all things are and were created, thou hast gathered our people out of many lands and races into a great nation. We commend to thy overruling providence the men and women of our forces by sea by land and in the air, beseeching thee to take into thine own hands both them and the cause they serve. Be thou their strength when they are set in the midst of so many and great dangers, and grant that whether by life or by death they may win for the whole world fruits of their sacrifice and a just peace. Guide, we beseech thee, the nations of the world into the way of justice and truth, and establish among them that peace which is the reward of righteousness. 
make the whole people of this land equal to our high trust, reverent in the use of freedom, just in the exercise of power, generous in the protection of weakness. Enable us to guard for the least among us the freedom we covet for ourselves. Make us ill-content with the inequalities of opportunity which still prevail among us. Amen. We take you now to New York. You have just heard a political broadcast under the sponsorship of the 1000 Club of the United States of America in behalf of the candidacy of Franklin D. Roosevelt, Democratic nominee for re-election as President of the United States. The Screen Guild Players, presented by the makers of Lady Esther Face Powder, the Johnny Morgan Show, presented by the makers of Valentine Beer and Ale, and Thanks to the Yanks, presented by the makers of Camel Cigarettes over many of these stations, we're not broadcast tonight due to the special political broadcast which you have just heard.